So whenever during during the talk, whenever you had a question, just feel free to unmute or, and ask. Um, or if you don't want to do that, just pop it in the chat window, and then I'll look up their talk time and try to answer the questions as we go on. Uh, I don't want this to feel uh, like a one way uh, kind of a lecture. It's uh, it's going to be a bit more interactive. So hopefully we get some interactions and we get some uh, really good um, pointers and everything from the talk. Uh, it's a, it's it's a it's an unconventional talk. So embrace yourself. Some cool stuff is coming your way. So hopefully you'll get um, a few things to take away and explore and play with uh, to be able to improve the performance of whatever the application you're working on, regardless of whether it's a progressive web app or what language it's. So this, this talk is completely language agnostic. We're not gonna delve into any, any language and all the demos are written in plain JavaScript. So should we wait a few minutes and kickstart, Stater? It's a uh, one minute past, so I guess we can just get started. Get started? Okay. Yeah. So, oh, cool. No worries. Hello, folks. Uh, welcome to the last day of NDC London 2021. Hopefully, you've had a wonderful journey so far, and you've been in many different talks and workshops, and um, it's been giving you enough information to be able to spend a few months at least busy trying to explore these all, all these new ideas and new technologies and, and so on and so forth. So today, what we're going to talk about here is web performance, but without relying on any third party providers. So what we're going to do here is we're going to just use the tools that are available to us. And then we use those tools to improve the performance and the user experience. At the end of the day, web performance is right equal to user experience. If you can get a good user experience, improving the performance is just brutal. So we need to be careful with that. So just to kickstart the talk, let me just tell you a bit, little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Yas, I'm a uh, software architect and Azure technical trainer at Microsoft. I've been in consulting for a few days, uh, for a few years before this, but recently I joined Microsoft as an Azure technical trainer. Um, I maintain a blog which has a lot of a ton of stuff regarding the front end um, and also all the other technologies. Uh, you can find me at Twitter at Yas Hints and also the same thing on LinkedIn and, and GitHub. So hopefully uh, we'll get to catch up there as well. So web performance, before I start and go into the details of the talk, let's be on the same page, right? Web performance is the act of monitoring and analyzing the speed and the interactivity of any application and sort of find out the ways to improve it. We, we are all uh, looking into what aspects of this web app can we improve to gain a bit of a performance so that we can get a better user experience. So that's all the thing that we are talking about here, right? Performance uh, bottlenecks can happen on either side. On the client side, on the server side, they can happen on both sides. But on, for this topic, for this talk, we're just gonna focus on the client side. There are heaps of stuff available for the server side. And it also uh, very is very related to what uh, server do you use, whether you're using a Linux or Windows and, and whether you use Node.js or ASP.NET or Java or whatever. So we're just going to talk about client side and JavaScript today. The process of measuring the performance is pretty easy. You measure the performance, you create a baseline, then you go through uh, your uh, uh, second, uh, some improvements for what you found out. And then once you've done that improvements, you just go back and measure again, just so that you make sure that you're uh, moving in the right direction. So you don't want to improve something and then cause a performance bottleneck somewhere else, or or even 
uh, find out that the user experience is not uh, improved at all. So what's the process? The process, uh, and where does it happen? It really is simple. Uh, you have a lab environment and your production environment. The lab environment is completely up to you. It could be your local machine, it could be a dev environment, it could be a QA environment. It really is up to your team to decide what your lab environment look like. But you do your measurements in the lab environment, you do your improvements in the lab environment, and you measure it again, and then you push to production. You again, you measure it here, and once you're measuring that in, in the production and everything looks good, then you can push back um, and then improve and do it again, uh, all the measurements of that uh, into your lab environment as well. So uh, measuring the lab environment, if everything looks good, push to production, again, measure if everything looks good, again, find out where else is having a problem and then find that again in the lab environment. So it's pretty simple. So when it comes to performance optimization, we need to have some metrics. We can't just go and try to improve the performance without having some goals. These metrics are our goals, right? There are five main categories of these metrics available for you to look at. The very first one is perceived load speed. What does this mean? It's not about page load speed. It's a bit different. Perceived load speed is how speedy the user thinks and uh, the, here we are very, very uh, bold on the think. So how user thinks your website is fast enough or not. It's not about being, your website being slow or being fast. It's about user perception. The next one is load responsiveness. This is about how fast your application loads and renders all the JavaScript and HTML and CSS to be able to respond to the user uh, in, uh, interaction after the, after the page is loaded. Runtime responsiveness is how fast you're responding to user interaction. If a user clicks on a button, how fast you're replying to that. If a user um, is interacting with a dropdown or, a, or anything that requires some sort of a code base behind the scene to happen, such as, I don't know, a lookup or anything else, how fast you are responding to your users. Visual stability, this is also very important. This is not directly uh, related to web performance, but it's very important. It's part of the metrics of the web performance. And that's um, talking about how much jumping do you have on your page? Does your page elements on the page move in an unexpected way uh, that the user doesn't expect? And then the last thing is the smoothness. If you have animations, if you have videos, how smooth are those and how uh, consistent are you using those frames to render whatever you're having on the page? So now that we know what's the performance and then we know some, uh, some details about the metrics and, and, and what, we're gonna talk about why. Why does it matter? Why should we care about the performance, right? There are three main categories where we should think about performance. And the performance, a better performance helps us to be better in what we do. The first one is conversion. Now, conversion can be a bit um, unclear sometimes. And the reason is there are many different ways to define conversion. In its simplest form, if a user is on a page, it, it, they, they're going into a browser, they entered your website URL on the browser and they landed on your homepage. What do they do next? If they click on a button, that's conversion. If they fill up a survey, that's some sort of a conversion. How can how they interact with, with your website? Sometimes navigating from one page to another is also a form of conversion. So it's up to you how you can define your conversion and it's very, very business related and can be defined by businesses in different means. The next one is traffic. Obviously, the more traffic you have, the more revenue you'll get, right? And the last one is UX, user experience. So why UX is so important? Because most of the time, our marketing and our sales team uh, will not be able to reach to those parts where our users are. 
let's say they are visiting the site on a different con con um, country where we don't have any presence. If the site is good, the word of mouth, that sort of uh, re Google reviews and, and stuff like that will help us to spread the word and get more uh, users into our system. So it's really important. These three are the main reasons behind why we should care about web performance in general. Just to give you a bit of an example, Amazon in 2016 found out that every 100 millisecond delay on their shopping website costs them about 1% of their annual sale. Now, you might think that 1% is not enough, is not a big, big enough number. And that's, that's mostly the case for a lot of companies who are out there. But for Amazon, it's, it's sort of a different story. Amazon made about $3.3 billion in just 2019. And 1% of that, that would be equal to 330 million per annum. So it's, it's a really big number. And 100 millisecond is really easy to get it wrong. 100 millisecond is nothing basically in terms of uh, user interaction on a web application. So how to measure? How to measure the application, the performance of your application? There are many, many third party tools that you could use, right? So third party tools here, uh, for example, you have your, I don't know, um, web page test, you have uh, New Relic and, and a lot of different tools which allow you to measure the performance both on the server side and on the client side. Like you can, you can do whatever on both sides. But here today, we are not talking about this. We are not talking about this at all. We are talking about here. We have some tools which are readily available to us using our browser uh, developer tools. Um, and specifically in, in, ter in, form of, in terms of Chrome dev tools, there is this great tool called Lighthouse. Uh, you might have heard of it, you might have worked with it extensively. Lighthouse is sort of a set of tools which allow you to measure uh, your application in different ways. Uh, it, it's got accessibility, web performance, uh, you know, uh, PWAs and a lot of different metrics, but we're just focusing on the uh, web performance of the application in terms of uh, that metric. So if you're just relying on, let's say your browser and the APIs that are readily, readily available to us through the browser, right? So um, the way it works is that there will be some uh, specs, right? The, the, the web standard, these APIs are pretty much in uh, many different ways, helping the users to do some something. But unfortunately, the thing that I've found out during my consulting um, journey is that not a lot of people know about this API. They're not really um, the focus point of uh, all the developers out there and they're not using it, mainly because those third party tools that I mentioned, they will shield these, they will use these behind the scenes. In fact, Lighthouse uses these APIs behind the scenes as well, but because they are shielding this from you, you don't go and you don't explore and you don't understand how, uh, how much valuable uh, tools, how many valuable tools are there for you. So we're gonna start with monitoring APIs. The first thing we wanna do, if you remember from our previous slide, is to measure, is to monitor, right? So we're gonna go through some APIs which allow you to monitor your application and potentially, uh, all of these allow you to write some code, which are not that much, but get a lot of insights into your web applications. So the first thing we're gonna go through is user timing API. The next one is performance timeline API. We're gonna go through navigation timing API, resource timing API, and the long tasks API. These are just five, top five that I've chosen, but there are much, much more and that you can go and explore on the MDM website. So let's start with user timing API. User timing API is about performance marks. You can think about performance marks as a point in time. If your application is doing something, if you have a point in time, you can then measure how long it took from that point onto the next point, which is another mark. So that's what we call a performance mark. So here, what you have here is basically, if you say this is my timeline, this here is point, let's say zero, and this here is point one. Then this 
these these points are called marks and then the next thing that happens is when you decide or when you calculate how much how long it took between point a and point b this is what we call measure right so we have marks point a point b and the measure which is the this difference between these two all of these are accessible through the performance object in the browser so if you go into your uh, dev tools into the developer uh, tools and into your console and just type performance you get access to all of these right just to i show you a bit of an example here you can see that i'm uh, we are doing some feature detection here. So we are saying that if mark actually is defined on the performance object, mainly because there might be some browsers who doesn't support mark and you don't want to have errors on your console be just because you're using some uh, features on the browser API, right? So we are doing a feature detection here. And when the feature detection is finished, you're creating a mark here doing some work which takes about let's say five seconds or 50 seconds then we're going to do some other uh, tasks here and we're going to wait for again 25 more seconds and we create another mark so this is how you create marks using this api now as i mentioned when you create your marks you have your marks uh, already defined then you can do measure and the measure is a function which allows you to enter a name so when you enter a name uh, this measure is defined and then you can give it two points or two marks and it will calculate uh, the difference between these two so it's pretty simple api but it's very powerful it allows you to measure how long a particular task took without being relying on any third-party application. You can clear the marks. Obviously, you can look through all the marks and clear the marks. If you know their name, you can pass the name and clear it. If you don't know their name, you can just call the clear all marks uh, and clear marks and don't pass any arguments, which then clears all of them. So the next thing, the next API we're going to cover is performance timeline API. This is, again, a set of APIs that add some extensions on top of the performance object. Some of these ex extensions are experimental, uh, some of these are not. And, and also the, the thing about this uh, timeline API, the good thing about it is that it will allow you to have observers. Uh, if you think of the other API as we talked about, that API sort of helps you to measure, but that's like passive. It doesn't, have, it doesn't happen, nothing happens. If something happened on your website, you wouldn't know. You need to do something. With the observers, you basically uh, create a function, which is your callback function, and then you create an observer, which observes some sort of an element or some sort of an event on the page. And when something happens, your callback function would get called. It's a very powerful tool. It's like webhooks, but for API. So here it is. You can see, for example, that this API is uh exposing a set of uh functions here and the very first one is the get entry so you can get all the marks that are already defined and you can look through them uh using a normal for loop here or what you can do here is you can create a performance observer and that performance observer gets a function it gets a list of items or marks or, or all the measures that are defined. And then you can then look through those again with that list and do something with it. Now I can see that on, on, on this example, what we are here, what we are observing on is mark and frame. We are observing on these two. So if you have created, let's say three marks, what you get here from this list is those three marks. So, you could see that how useful this, this measure can be because then you can create an observer, for example, for your measures, and then say in your handler, say, whenever a measure is longer than X amount of time, then do something for me or log an event or raise an alert or whatever, right? So it's a really good API as well. The performance entry, the entry that you get on that uh, get entries method each of those have 
uh, is an object which has four properties, name, entry type, start time, and duration. Now, entry type could be marked, could be measured, could be um, framed, whatever it, that you've defined before. A start time is the start of the thing, and the duration, which is the duration of how, how long it took. Duration could be null, for example, for marks, because they're just a point in time, but they could have some values for the measures. Now, it's really important to uh, specify the uh, browser compatibility for these APIs. Fortunately, with this user timing API, which contains all the things that we just talked about, all the APIs, it's pretty much supported all the major browsers. There are some uh, browsers who doesn't support it, let's say Opera Mini here, but apart from that, most of these browsers are already supporting all of these methods that we just talked about. So you feel free to go and explore and, and play with those APIs. The next one is navigation timing API. Well, navigation timing API helps us with a bunch of things like how much it took for a page to load. Uh, if you send a request to get, uh, let's say, if we send a request for, for our APIs to get something, how long it took from when we sent the request until the response came back. Uh, if our page is rendering, how much it took for the page from the load until it's completely rendered. So these are the uh, really cool things that you can measure with this uh, API. Now, one of the examples here, we are calculating the page load time. Now, all of these are again exposed to performance, but this time it's another object which is called timing. So if you go through performance, then the next object, which is timing, you will have all of these properties exposed on the timing. Now here, all we are saying is that we want to have the load event end, so the end of our load, and then navigation start, which is the very first thing that happens after a user enters a page. So from, if you basically calculate these two, it will get the total load page time, uh, the total page load time for us, then we can do something with that information. So as you can see, it's a pretty powerful tool and it allows you to do this within your, um, application. You don't need to have any other third-party uh, providers for you to do this. Here, we're just saying that response end requests to start, and these two deduction would give us the response time. So let's say you're sending a, a, an API call to a REST endpoint, how, how long it took for the response to come back. You could calculate it this way. And here, you could just say, hey, I want my DOM complete and DOM loading, and these two, again, will give you the page render time. So how long it took for the page to get fully rendered. And then you could basically uh, show these in a nice table. If you wanted to do that, you could get entries by type. For example, you could get the navigation. And then for that entry, you could convert it to JSON by using it to JSON. And that will give you a nice table. And the table looks like this. So you, you will give you, uh, for example, the entry type. And then the end, this is one navigation um, object. So you could have multiple navigation objects throughout the time, but this is one snapshot of the navigation object. You can see that the request start, request end, response, all of these ones are basically listed here. The browser support for this is also really good. So this is a very, very powerful API, which is already supported in all the major browsers. The next API we're going to talk about is resource timing API. Now, resource timing API, first of all, we're going to say that this works with high resolution timestamps. High resolution timestamps are pretty much um, until like they're very accurate. They cover not only milliseconds, but also uh, microseconds. So they are pretty much high resolution timestamps. You could just uh, use these time steps to measure uh, request timing. So for example, how much it took for, for an HTML file to get loaded uh, or get downloaded, how much it took for a JavaScript file, what was the size of the last resource that was um, downloaded. You could get all of that with this particular API. You could see that this API exposes a lot of cool things here. For example, for you can measure uh, redirect uh, here, 
with redirects you have the start time and then the redirect start and then you have redirect end this is really useful if you wanted to measure how long it took for a page to for example get redirected if you have a redirect setup you could measure that here um, for caching you could just say fetch start and then the domain lookup start for dns uh, for TCP connect the start, you could actually measure how long it took for your TCP connection to get established. Uh, you could measure the request and response time as we mentioned before. So it's a really good API. Uh, you can find out more about this API and some example on the link that I've put here. So feel free to go and explore um, all the goodness of this particular API. Now, if you wanted to calculate the redirect time, you could just see that we are getting the uh, get entries by type and we are passing resource. So we are just caring about our resources here. Uh, if, if it's not undefined, if, uh, if there is uh, something in it, then we're gonna look through those and then for each of those, get the name. And then for each of, uh, for each of these uh, resources, we're going to get the redirect in and the redirect stuff. So let's say we wanted to calculate the redirect time for all of these resources. If we wanted to uh, calculate the fetch, as we saw before, response end and fetch and start, this is again another thing that we could uh, easily uh, calculate for all the resources that are downloaded for our website. Uh, Funny thing about this is that it also works for third party tools. So let's say you, your website is loaded on a, um, on a client side and they have a, a lot of plugins installed on their Chrome or they have a lot of things that just keep adding advertisement and third party libraries to your, um, to your application and makes your application slower. You could actually measure those in this particular, with this particular API and find out for example, how, how many resources are being loaded through your website? Um, because not all of the resources are uh, for your website. For example, you might have Facebook ads or you might have like uh, things that are getting added by uh, Chrome plugins. Here you can see like we are just calculating the resource size of all the resources. You could see that they are encoded. So you're gonna get the uh, decoded body size uh, and then the transfer size will give you the transfer uh, size over the network and you could get everything that you want using these uh, APIs regarding the size. So uh, there, there should be a bit of a calculation happen to completely understand how uh, how big a file was or how, how big how, basically how much uh, megabyte or how many megabytes it took to get downloaded or, or even kilobytes, but it's completely doable. So it's very easily uh, and readily available for you. And the la last API that we're going to talk about here is the tasks um, that are long running. Now, the definition of long running is different for different people, but the standard says 50 milliseconds. Uh, if you think about um, your frame rate, right? We always say, hey, 60 frames per second or 30 frames per second. That is not just for your application. So you're gonna have to have like a lot of stuff to happen when your application is loading. You're gonna have animations. You're gonna have uh, downloading files. You're gonna be rendering HTML and JavaScript and executing that JavaScript and painting the page. And a lot of things should happen within that one second. So a long running task on the web based on the standard is 50 milliseconds or more. If a single task takes more than that, it is basically uh, recognized as a long running task. And this API helps you to find that uh, out. So you can, again, you can using, a, uh, using an observer, you could basically create an observer on the long tasks and then that will you can pass a function which gets the list and then that will give you all the entries for that particular so you can see all the long running tasks here uh, and then using the other api which i showed you you could calculate like uh for example from start to end 
and duration and, and all the other stuff that we just saw. So this is again a very powerful API. This particular API is in the draft state. So it's not finalized yet. It's supported on Edge and Chrome because they're using Chromium. Um, it's supported in Opera, but a lot of um, other browsers such as Safari, Firefox, they're not even supporting the basics. So you're gonna probably have to wait some time if you're using, if you wanted to test these in, on Safari or Firefox or even IE and previous versions, but from Chrome and Edge perspective, it's fully working. Now, all of those APIs that we just saw, they were helping us to monitor the performance of the application. But let's say we found out some issues. We found out that the page is slow or something is not right or a video is playing and it's consuming uh, users' data. Now, what we can do is we can use a set of different APIs which are helping us to improve the performance. Now, this is about doing, this is about the action. Is there any questions so far? By the way, I've just gone probably way faster than I should have. But please, if you have any question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, I tend to go on a bit fast and because I get excited about these APIs and I, I, you know, I want to share that excitement with you, but feel free to stop me and ask your questions and I'm happy to answer any question you might have. If there are no questions, let's go through these APIs. I've handpicked four APIs that I found out that are super cool, and we're gonna see um, examples of these in the demo as well. The first one that we're gonna look at is the Network Information API. This API allows you to get network information. Let's say you wanted to find out whether your user is using a 2G network or a 4G network, or uh, basically what uh, what is their download speed? What is their upload speed? All of these information can be obtained using this API. It's a really powerful API. The next one is page visibility API. A lot of times, if you're like me, you're opening like 100 tabs in your browser. And that's troublesome. You know why? Because even on a mobile device, it gets worse. Because if I'm looking at something, and then the next second I'm looking at a different thing, then the previous hey, shouldn't consume my data, shouldn't do anything, let alone uh, calling APIs or, or basically updating the content on the page because I'm not looking at it. This API helps us to figure out whether a user is looking at your page or they're not on the page at all. We're gonna see an example. The next one is Resource Observer API. Sometimes the page, the application that you have, it's gonna be displayed on a monitor this size that I'm using, Sometimes it's gonna be on a mobile device. It's really important that we understand how uh, that aspect works and then do something about it reactively. Now, you already um, know about responsive design and this talk is not about responsive design. I'm not talking about reflecting to the responsiveness of the page, no. This is about basically resizing an element. If uh, an element was, for example, I don't know, uh, 100 by 100 pixels and suddenly it's resized to 50 by 50, how can you rearrange the information and show still meaningful information to the users using um, just code, using browser uh, API? And the last one we're gonna see is the intersection API. If I, I remember when I was way younger, I'm not gonna point to uh, reveal my age here, but when I was way younger, I, re I remember I was trying to find out whenever uh, something appeared on the screen. So if, if, if I had a long page and the user was scrolling through the page slowly, I wanted to figure out when something appears on the page so that I can reflect or re react. I can show an alert or I can do something about it. It was so damn hard. In fact, it was so hard and I had to write a lot of code that uh, I got memory overflow on IE. Uh, it was so terrible. That code was like, I, I never forgive myself for writing that code. But we don't need to do that anymore. The Intersection Observer API will allow us to find out whether some element appears on a target element. And the good thing about it is that the target element doesn't necessarily need to be your viewport. It can be another element. It could be a div, it could be anything. So let's say you have a long page 
and you have an image, let's say image tag, which is not appeared on that page on the, on the viewport yet. So user actually hasn't seen that yet. Why should that image get loaded, right? These are the problems that this API is trying to solve for you. So let's go through the full information API. Again, I mentioned that this helps you to uh, basically get the connection information for a user. You could do a lot of things with this, um, uh, with this information. You could also hook into the um, network change event. So if, if let's say your user is on a train, and they were having 4G before that, but now they're on a 3G because they're in a train, they're in a tunnel. Uh, you could actually hook up into this API and be aware of those changes. It's a super, super cool API. And we're gonna see a demo of this shortly. Well, detecting the change, at the moment, you're gonna have to do some feature detection just to find out um, what's the name of this particular API. With the previous ones, it was, very straightforward because the standard was like there, it was already approved and everything was good. With this one, because the standard has been taken a long time to finish, every major browser has named it differently. So in Chrome, it's called connection. In, in Firefox, it's called most connection. In Safari, it's called WebKit connection. So you're gonna have to have to, you know, do a bit of a um, feature detection to figure out which um, browser the user is using. And then once you find that, you could get the effective type and then the effective type will give you the information you like. And you could get all the other information as well. And then you could also uh, add an event listener to the change event of that update connection, for example, your connection. So here, one of the examples is that if you're preloading, let's say, your resources. So preload, what is preloading? Preloading is an act of um, improving the web performance by um, preloading some resources which are then gonna be used in near future. Let's say you have, you're on your homepage and you know that 60% of your users or 70% of your users go from home to your shopping uh, cart or shopping page. And you know that the very first thing that they see in the shopping page is an image. You could preload that image, keep it in the browser's memory, and when the user goes there into that page, it's already there. The browser doesn't need to send a request, it just uses that image, and the page load is much, much faster. So that's what, that's what we call preloading. So you're preloading a video, you're gonna basically um, monitor the effective type of that connection. If it's slow 2G, then you're gonna not preload that video. We don't need to get you know, that, that much information from the server if the user is on a slow network, which probably hurts their user experience because the page is waiting and waiting and waiting for that much information to get loaded, but also it will hurt the user in a way that it's actually consuming their data without them actually uh, needing it. In terms of the browser support, it's behind feature flags in Edge and Chrome. Um, in, in the latest versions of Chrome, they're already available, but uh, you don't have access to all the uh, properties that are defined on the standard. Some of the properties are defined and that are uh, you know, available on Chrome and Edge uh, and also Opera, but um, they're not available in Safari and Firefox. The funny thing about this API is that if you have a look at this section, a lot of mobile browsers already support it, mainly because the connection is much important, is more important on a mobile device than a desktop or a laptop. So uh, that's why these um, browsers, the mobile browsers are already supporting this API pretty much um, very good. So let's, let's go through a demo before I jump into uh, this next API. So what we're gonna do here, I'm gonna walk you through an application that I've written for this particular um, talk. So what we have here is, an, is a plain JavaScript application. All right? we, we have a, a source folder, this source folder has some JSON files which we're serving and exposing an APIs. Um, 
and we've got a basically a public folder which has got all of our assets like images and, and videos it's got a bunch of css files it's got fonts images and a bunch of other stuff right and uh, the, the the way the app is written is pretty simple every page is a component it has um, basically three methods it's got a preload it's got the render and then it's got the postload or or um, basically after the deploy so here for example you could see that i'm calling this this is a component this is a page it's got a render so this is the main function which renders the page it's got an after render and it's got a before render so the, these are available on all of these um, here now if i go into one of the pages here you could see that each page basically is just an object which has the render function and you can see that in the render function we are returning our view which is an html um, and then we have the after render function which basically is a bunch of javascript and then we are exporting all of these back so all, all the pages are following the same pattern it's pretty easy to understand it's pretty easy to set up now for this particular api we have our in our home page we have an image we have let's let me show you the let me just actually run the application and show you uh, npm start. Let me show you how what how our application looks like. This is our application, right? <clears throat> if I come into my network tab, so this is the developer tools. If you don't know how to get there, F12, or even from the menu, you could just open up the dev tools by going to more tools and developer tools, or press Control Shift I. When you're in the developer tools, you could just go into the network tab and then filter on image. And that will then allow you to only query all the network calls for images. Now, if I clean this application up and refresh the page, you could see that I'm getting uh, an image here, which is called uh, train. And that, that is the train image that is shown here. This is one of the Melbourne uh, train, right? Now this, is basically 251 kilobyte but i know that this uh, image doesn't need to be this size on a mobile device it, it needs to be very much smaller so what can we do about this using this api that we just saw here you could see that i'm just getting that image and sending it back if i uncomment this bit of code what are we doing here is that hey we're going to detect what connection is the user using i could have just used connection because this is chrome where i wanted to show you the feature detection part and then the effective type if the connection exists and the effective type is for example 2g or user has ticked that save data um, on slower connections on their phone some phones have that option they could actually save data while they're on a slower network if that's the case, they want, I want to replace this train image with a train image, which is a lower resolution. So this is a much, much smaller um, image. So we're gonna do that. To do that, we're gonna have to rebuild our uh, npm run build, rebuild our application because you just uncommented that. And forget about these errors that you see here. Something happened between these noon and this afternoon and parcel is giving me some errors which is actually a known issue but hopefully um, it doesn't bother us that much and if i do npm start again i can come into my application here and you could see that if i now so this was the train and then i can then go and click that and you could see that still the train is loading however if i change this this drop down here allows me to simulate a slow connection. So if I click on this drop down and select slow 3G, for example, then you could see that the network tab is going to have a, a warning sign next to it, which means that the network is now throttled. And then if I then do that, when that loads, and you could see what when the network is throttled that my page is loading very very um slower 
And here it is. Here is our low res image. And you can see that the image is not really that different, even on a desktop browser. But in this time, it's much, much uh, basically smaller. So this could be like a much smaller version of that. Image. Um, that's one of the one of the basically usage of this particular APR. Any questions so far? If not, let's go through our next APR. How are we going with time? We're gonna to have to hustle a bit more. So page visibility API, this API allows us to find out whether a page uh, is open and the user is looking at it or not. It exposes these uh, properties on the document object of your browser. So hidden visibility state, which basically is like equal hidden or, or not. And then this event that you could just hook up into and find out whether the visibility is changing or not. So let's say you have an open tab and then you open a new tab and you're not in the previous tab. This API helps us to detect that. What are the use cases for this API? If you're playing a video, let's say you're playing a movie and then the user is going to a different page, you could just stop the movie and then resume the movie when the user comes back. Image carousels, if you have a lot of images in a carousel and you're shuffling through the carousel, halfway through the user has gone to a different page, you don't even need to load the future images until the user is back. Server calls again, if your user is not on the page, why are you sending REST calls to get the data? And switch off sand and switch on sand as well, are part of these APIs. Uh, similar to that, we're gonna have to do some feature detection to, to uh, figure out what this is called. So you can see that visibility change is called visibility change is Chrome. It's called MS visibility change is IE WebKit in Mozilla, uh, in uh, Safari. And then once we found that, that we could then define our uh, handler and then add an event listener to that visibility change event that we found it and pass our handler to it and then whenever the visibility changes, this particular handler is getting called. At this example here, this is the demo that we're gonna see in a minute. Uh, I'm just pausing the video which is playing and playing again um, after that. So let's go through the demo quickly. So what I have here is a page which is called history. This page is nothing but a video. So I'm just playing a video here, it's an MP4 video. Um, and then if I then come now to my application here and go to the history, you could see that this video is now playing. If I come back here, yep, yeah, still playing. I need to change this to online because that's gonna cause us a lot of issues. As you can see that this video is playing, I can update it. Now, if I open up a new window here, you can see that the video is still playing and nothing happens. Now, let's go and do something different here. So this time, I'm gonna come here and uncomment this bit of code here, which is exactly doing what we just saw. So what are we doing here? is we're gonna get the video element and we're gonna define our callback function. And this callback function is gonna check the document.hidden. If the document is hidden, then it's gonna pause the video element. Otherwise, it's gonna play the video element. So it's pretty simple. There's nothing um, to it. And because we are using Chrome, we're gonna know that we are using the visibility change event. So because I just uncommented that, we're gonna stop this and run our build command again so that the app is getting built. I need to <laughs> excuse my kid, she is making some sounds here. If you could hear that, just um, it's pretty late here, they're gonna go to sleep, but yeah, there are some sounds and whatnot at the moment. So if I do npm start here and then come back into my browser. Now, we're gonna need to refresh the page, but that's fine. If I now play the video, you could see that the video is playing and I can unplug the video screen. just so you can hear the voice. Now, pay attention to what happens if I keep the page. 
you, you see that the voice is now stopped. That's because I've paused the video and I'm waiting for the user to come back. And when they come Mr. back, the Zoom software is definitely so this is a much, much better experience to the user rather than the previous one. It's not directly related to web performance, but, it's, but it helps save users' data. It helps uh, basically to stop the video, and that stopping the video is going to allow us to do a lot of other things uh, within that. So let's move on with our slide. We're going to... <coughs> Pause a little bit so that we can finish the, the last two API. The next one is Resource Observer API. This API here is going to allow us to uh, react to the page resize events. Now, how this works is that again, we're going to create an observer and pass it an element, and that will be our root element. And for that root element, we're going to basically get our callback function get called every time the element is going to be resized. So at this example, I'm just changing the font size, but you could do a lot of stuff if the page is too small, you could hide the image, which I'm gonna show you, um, or a lot of different stuff. You could go crazy with ideas on how to improve the web performance. So let's go through a demo again. I have an about page here, <coughs> which contains a lot of text. So this is like a page which contains a lot of text and uh, the default, and I've got also here uh, an image. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you an image here, uh, and then a lot of text here. And at the moment, we're not doing anything. So if I come into my browser here, and that's just showing that our app is working, um, you can see that this here, uh, that I've got some text here, and this uh, basically is rendering, if I keep resizing this page, nothing happens. It's just that the image gets resized based on that. Um, and this basically is what happens when we resize the page. Now let's go back and enable uh, our code, which is, the, which is doing exactly that. So it's gonna basically change the font size. So it's gonna reduce the font size if the page is getting smaller. And also if the page is smaller than a particular threshold, it's going to display uh, that image or hide it if the page is too small. Now, let me just again <clears throat> build this application again. npm run build, and that will allow me to build the application again. And hopefully, this is going to take a bit of a time. You feel free to ask any questions. Uh, for those of you folks who joined uh, recently and haven't gone through the previous one, what we are doing here is we are doing we are using some of the APIs that are available in the browser to improve the web performance. And at this point, we're talking about the resize observer API. So let me just start my application again. And this time we're gonna go into oops. We're gonna go into our page and I'm gonna do a bit of a resizing here. So you could see that because I'm resizing the page to a much larger real estate, my font size is getting bigger. If I resize it, which, which I can actually do uh, simulated using this adjust width here, which I've put here. So I can then reduce the size of the div and not just the viewport. So I'm just reducing the size of the div and you can see that the font is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And at some point, even the image is going to disappear. Now we didn't reach to that point because my monitor is super big, but take my word for it. So <clears throat> the browser support for the Resource Observer is again, it's pretty cool. Uh, apart from IE and Opera Mini and a few of the mobile browsers, most of the browsers are already supported, so go and explore. And the last thing we want to see is the Intersection Observer API. Intersection Observer API, as I mentioned before, allows you to detect when one element appears inside a, another element. So we call the main element the root element, and then you have your basically target element when you want to monitor. Again, you can create an observer, and this API allows you to have two objects here. The very first one is intersection observer, 
which you have to create an instance of when you want to work with this API. And then the next one is intersection observer entry. Every time something triggers, that API calls, uh, that API calls your handler and pass one of these entries to your API. So what are the use cases? If you want to lazy load images, you could use this API. Why? Because you could then find out when an image is going to appear on the screen and then load that image before it appears. If you wanted to implement influence scrolling, if you, let's say you're on a mobile um, device and you wanted to uh, basically implement the influence scroll, you could do that. Ad revenue reporting, this is super important. If you wanted to find out how many ads are appearing on the screen, how, how many ads are being clicked on, you could use this API to figure out that as well. And also you could prevent learning tasks or animations if they are not on the screen yet. So these are some of the use cases, but there are many other use cases as well. If you wanted to use this API, you could, you have to pass some options to it. So the, the options that are, you have to pass has a root element, and this is the element that uh, we are defining. This could be the viewport, this could be the body, this could be uh, a div. Then you have a margin. So how basically the margin is the space around the element that you're monitoring. And you could say, I want, for example, 100 pixel margin. Uh, so that will give you a 100 pixel space uh, before your trigger, before your function gets triggered. The threshold again uh, is another metric and it will give you, um, for example, uh, from zero to 100, it will give you a space where you wanna say, okay, if I have a div and I have a bigger div, how much of the target div is gonna appear before my function gets called? That, that's called the threshold. So you could just say oh, my threshold is one. I, wanna, I want this to be uh, triggered whenever all the space of that content is appeared on the screen. But be careful with the threshold because if your target element is bigger than the screen, then your function is never gonna get called. So you have to do some try and error based on the monitor size and whatnot. Then you create a new instance of the intersection observer as I showed you earlier. And then once you've done that, you pass it the call. And in the callback, you get a list of entries. And on the list of entries, you you do a for each, and then you have access to all of these properties. So you have access to, for example, the bounding client rectangle. So whatever the client rectangle uh, is on the screen. You have access to, for example, intersection ratio, like how, how much of the target elements is inside the uh, root element. Uh, are they actually intersecting? You could just use this flag to figure out whether they're intersecting or not, and so on and so forth. So we're gonna see a demo now. And then after that, we are gonna be finished. I know that we are running a bit behind, but bear with me. So what do we have here is a page. It's just an image gallery. Um, and then nothing happens here, right? So I've got some code here, which is basically creating my intersection observer API. And then it's uh, querying all the images and then it checks whether the image is inside my uh, target element, the root element, and if it is, then it will uh, change the property of the source, which I'm gonna change it in a second, um, to data source, and then change it to source. So what will happen at the moment, if I load my website and go to the gallery page, is that if I comment, you see that I'm still filtered by image and you can see that I have eight images and all of them are loaded, although I haven't even scrolled down. I can see only one, but eight images are being loaded. How can we can fix this? We could just come here and then we could just say, I want, uh, for example, let's say this one, I want to replace this with data source, I want to replace this with data source for this as well, and that one, and that one. Now, if you do that, you could see that only the first three should get loaded because there is a source attribute to it, and the other ones shouldn't because it's data source. 
Now here in our method, we're gonna get all the lazy loaded images, which basically is a class that I've added to my to all my images, and then create my observer on those. And if they are gonna appear on the screen and the threshold that I've put is like 0.9, uh, then load those images as we go on. So let's rebuild the application, npm run build again. And this time, what we're gonna see is that these images shouldn't get loaded until they are about to appear on the screen, which is what we want. So if you have thousands of images on the page, none of those images will get loaded unless they are gonna appear on the screen. So we can start, and then when we do that, we can come here, and I'm gonna do a hard refresh. You can see only the three, the first three are appearing on the screen, and if I now keep scrolling down, you could see that this is now triggering the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and so on and so forth. So it's a pretty cool API. However, recently as of 20, uh, late 2019, Chrome added a new flag, which is called lazy. And then that will basically does that. So instead of writing this code, you could just use the lazy attribute on your images. And that is using the intersection observer API, which is here. And that's about it. The, the, here are some references. I've extensively blogged about most of these APIs on my blog, so definitely go and check it out. Check out the MDN documentation, which is the first thing up there, and hit me up on Twitter, LinkedIn, and even um, you know uh, GitHub. Uh, I've got uh, so much stuff on GitHub regarding these. I've got the examples, demos. If you want to check it out, just go there and check it out. Thanks for uh, being with me for a full hour. And I hope that uh, your rest of 2021 is gonna be bright, is gonna be stress-free, COVID-free, and enjoy your rest of the day, folks.